Afro Denial. It's the key focus of this part of the series, and by extension, the set of comic strips. Jasmine struggles to make sense of and love her blackness. Tom's negligence has led to Jasmine's self-hatred and desire to identify with her white mother. Let's start with their namesake. W.E.B. Du Bois is what Jasmine, and by extension, Tom, is named after. W.E.B. Du Bois coined the idea of double consciousness. What is double consciousness? It's the feeling that you have more than one social identity, which makes it difficult to develop a sense of self. Jasmine personifies this idea perfectly. The Souls of Black Folk is a piece written by W.E.B. Du Bois, where he discusses this idea. I won't read the full quote, just the really important part. It's a peculiar sensation, this double consciousness, this sense of always looking at oneself through the eyes of others, of measuring one's soul by the tape of a world that looks in the muse contempt and pity. One ever feels his two-ness, an American, a Negro, two souls, two thoughts, two unreconciled strivings, two warring ideals in one dark body, whose dogged strength alone keeps it from being torn asunder. Jasmine is torn between her racial identity. She's internalized insecurities around her blackness because she hasn't made sense of how to love it, what makes her hair beautiful, and to be blunt, it's because Tom hasn't empowered her. He's given into the idea that she should fix it. He hasn't investigated the idea that helping her make sense of her identity outside a Eurocentric lens would ultimately be beneficial for her. It's important to note that a big part of Jasmine's character at this point is that she feels lonely. She wants to make friends. In the leaked pilot script, what's actually happening in the story is that white kids are making fun of her and in an attempt to be accepted, she pretends to laugh and find it funny, all in an attempt to not be alone, to be accepted. This is also why there's such a stark contrast between how Huey and Cindy treat Jasmine. She has more than one social identity and as a result, is really struggling to make sense of who she is. But by virtue of global anti-blackness, she's going to veer more to the Caucasian, Eurocentric idea. Aaron has a quote where he says, when you have the black nationalist, you need the confused biracial girl. Remember what we said about black nationalism. It's quite literally about trying to build and develop and nurture a sense of self, identity and belonging outside these frameworks. Building a nation outside a Eurocentric institutional framework. Purely in that sense, pairing Huey with Jasmine in this comic is brilliant. But as I alluded to in the previous part, there was a lot of controversy here. There was a lot, there was a lot of controversy surrounding Jasmine. And you wouldn't know this if you just watched the show, but her depiction was such a point of contention for many people. Multiracial activists, the interracial voice, these were websites that had the biggest pushback to the Boondocks comic strip, going as far to archive every article disparaging the Boondocks in an attempt to get it taken down. Like I don't, at this point, I don't even need to cite anything. I can just link to the page, you can see it. But I will read some of it. Jasmine's parents are ridiculed to show Magruder's opposition to official interracial marriages. Her white mother is presented as a frivolous liberal who doesn't realize that she can never understand any black thing. And her father, Tom, no accidental use of that name, is presented as inferior to the black militant child, Huey, in understanding the racial realities of the world. Not surprisingly, Magruder opposes official interracial marriages while making Jasmine into a sex symbol for young black males like Huey. His webpage describes Jasmine as a confused cutie pie. We've heard that song before. Miss A.D. Powell, a political activist and self-identifying white multiracial author. Oh boy. <laughs> she had this to say. Aaron Magruder's hate propaganda is especially harmful for children who see the bullying and harassment of the multiracial character, Jasmine, into a false black identity presented as a positive thing. Indeed, the message that Jasmine is too inferior to also claim her European ancestry, but is a confused cutie pie for white self-hating black males, appears to be a theme of the boondocks. Magruder has spent more time on this theme than any other. Adults should know that they have the legal, social, and moral right to call themselves multiracial, or even that godlike appellation, white. Children, however, are vulnerable. They are targets for Magruder's will take you against your will advocacy of ethnic... I'm not gonna say that word. But I hope you're reading this and you're thinking to yourself, hey, this was kind of, this was kind of a big deal. <laughs> like, the writer of this strip needs to stop portraying white youth of today as narrow-minded and uneducated and focus on what comics are about, making people smile and laugh. The citations will be in the description, but once again, I have to stress, this was a big controversy at the time. 
to the point where Aaron had to respond to it on his website because this was the second time that audiences were trying to get the boondocks taken down. Again, I can't read the full thing, but citations will be in the description if you want to read Aaron's full thoughts. Just gonna do the key parts. People take Jasmine as a slam on multiracial people, but it's really not about that. Jasmine is really about being an African people reared in North America. It's all symbolic. That's why her last name is Du Bois, because of the color line and double consciousness. Jasmine is confused because we're all confused. We can't decide on a name. We can't decide on how we feel to Africa or America. Jasmine is our confusion. He'd go on to communicate that Jasmine and Huey are both supposed to be naive characters, and while one is more sure than the other, that doesn't take away from how they both feel or directly comment on who he thinks is right. I'll say it like this, those biracial people who feel instantly insulted by the mere implication that they are in fact black people will be insulted by the strip. They will be insulted because that is Huey's opinion and he will continue to speak it. I will not clown Huey because someone of African descent cannot stand being referred to as black. I will not take a character that represents youth and innocence and make her into a wisecracking cynic just so biracials with an anti-black political agenda can feel like they got the best of someone. Something about how Aaron describes Jasmine feels very sincere, especially in how he explains the concept behind the character, that he sees Jasmine as more sympathetic and likeable than Huey. Given the concept, writing Jasmine is anything other than confused and torn between her different worlds, her double consciousness, it would ultimately fly in the face of what the character was supposed to be and represent. Jasmine's character is an exploration into African American identity. She's not really about the confused mulatto. She's about a people torn between Africa and North America and confused about who we are as an ethnic group. We are, all of us, mixed. Most of us biologically, but all of us are mixed culturally. In that sense, biracial people are not separate or apart from African Americans. They in fact epitomize the African American. They personify the duality that is the entire ethnicity. Many people have wondered about my stance on biracial identity. This is it. If biracial people personify the duality that is the black experience, then it also contextualizes what Huey is saying here. Jasmine goes on to explain her experience, feeling isolated, alone, like a flower struggling with its sense of self. And finally, all Huey can muster in response is, Jasmine, you're black, get over it. And now, given the context, I think it's an appropriate response. A soft reminder here that citations are in the description. I can't read everything, but I do encourage you to take a look to get a sense for how deep this history goes. Making these videos takes a lot of research and it isn't easy. So remember to subscribe if you want to see more and support on Patreon if you want to see these videos early. All right, let's get back to the strips. <laughs> Welcome back to Behind the Boondocks, where we last left off, we said goodbye to Jasmine and Cindy, and we're beginning a new story arc. Huey is seeing Star Wars. As we discussed in the last part, Aaron's trademark is a random Star Wars reference. Keep this in mind moving forward, just generally. If you're watching anything by Aaron Magruder and you need to verify if he had a role to play in the production, look for the Star Wars reference and you'll find it. And you, you will find it. You will definitely find it. Anyway, while I like the punchline for this, it's interesting that Aaron characterizes Huey as a Star Wars fan too. And while he'll eventually explain his reasons for this, it's interesting that Aaron just couldn't help himself. This is probably the most tame and accessible story arc in the comics. I can't stress enough that it's just Huey wanting to see the Star Wars movie. I will say that this is the first time that Aaron does something topical. Keep in mind, the comics need to be submitted six weeks ahead of the deadline. So what Aaron was really writing here was some form of prediction. He has to future-proof his work in service of being topical. Anyway, the story of this guy is that he waited in line for a year to see the movie. Aaron ends it with a gay prison joke. Classy, but maybe a bit foreboding, if you want me to be honest. This is one of my favorite strips in the series, and it needs to be stated now because I'm going to talk about it for a little while. The story here is that Huey is scolding Riley for how much he glorifies crime and a specific lifestyle. The irony here being that Riley is telling Huey that while their intentions are different, they do very similar things. Speaking of satire, Last Sunday's Strip was a critique on contemporary black popular culture, which glorifies crime and jail. Riley is a product of that culture. His whole character is a satirical attack on the very things most of you claim to despise. I wonder if you guys fire off as many angry messages to BET as you do to me. Only they're doing it for real and I'm trying to make a point to the contrary. 
That's standard, but what interests me more is what Rome says as the webmaster. We're also wondering how many of you guys caught that the 516 strip was a commentary on how the thug mentality and revolutionary ideals have a thread of similarity, but is still ignore the law. This is a really rich part of the strip. It's effectively communicating that not only do both parties ignore the law due to their ideologies, but that in a certain context, they see eye to eye. Keep in mind that Huey and Riley are representative of two different eras of hip hop, we spoke about that a bit earlier, and you could even make the case that this speaks to the idea that regardless of what form, be the political or gangster era of hip hop it takes, the idea of being anti-authoritarian is ever present. Really cool stuff, I love this Sunday, I could talk about it forever. It's interesting to note that this is Huey's second direct interaction with a white guy from Woodcrest. The punchline here works, it leads into a microaggression and ends with Huey being happy that he's not affiliated with the average aesthetic. Huey finally explains why he likes Star Wars. He talks about the idea of it being an allegory for anti-colonial struggles in Africa and Asia, even going as far to cite the struggle for black liberation in the United States. I think he's reaching a bit, but I understand the point he's making. There's a book called Death of the Author that speaks to the idea that art isn't about the author's intention, but instead the reader's interpretation. A, a structuralist idea that art is a reflection of the time period it was created, and not always the intention. And if I'm to jump ahead here, this thinking, I think, applies very much to the boondocks. Is this a good time to talk about the artwork? Aaron's art style is very sketchy. I think outside the kids, he generally struggles to draw older characters. Not all the time, just sometimes. And when he does shots like this with a ton of older characters, it's a lot easier to notice. It's a comic strip though, like there's not much to really ever think here. It is interesting though that this is the first time the characters curse in the series. This really does set up the idea that while the Boondocks has childlike characters, it wasn't really aimed at children. Or maybe it was and just kind of overthinking it. I like the way they depict the cursing though. Aaron loved this comic trick where he writes like a ton on one page. It, it's nice that you can see in his prediction that he was confident in Samuel Jackson's performance. He does like he does quite a lot to kind of big up Samuel Jackson in the comic strip. And that makes sense given that even on the website, he has a photo with Samuel Jackson. So again, things to think about. This is a loaded comic strip with a ton of references designed to communicate a lot about Riley's character. A big one is that he's referencing Nas and at the time, Puffy. Remember when we spoke about how Huey and Riley are supposed to represent two different eras of hip hop, the political and gangster rap leans? Well, this strip is very explicit about it. Something I might go off topic and speak about is how the Boondocks makes a real effort to kind of parallel Huey and Riley. If you remember, this is effectively the same scene as Huey's, screaming their dreams on a hill for the world to know. It's interesting that the strip almost lacks a sense of self-awareness in doing this. One of the richest parts of Huey and Riley's dynamic is how they effectively mirror each other. And while the strip does do a good job in doing that, I do wish they leaned a little more into the idea. It's very easy to miss the parallels between Huey and Riley when Riley is presented as a derogatory satire and Huey is presented as unfiltered truth. I should even stress that my politics tend to lean closer to Huey's than you might think, and we'll get into that at a later time. But sometimes I wish this series approached Huey's naivety in the same vein as Riley's. Anyway, this wasn't about Huey, it's just a very obvious parallel and I found it very interesting to flag. This is Huey and Cindy's first canonical interaction. A few interesting things to note is that Cindy was originally Huey's age. There's not much to say other than Cindy clearly exoticizing Huey's blackness. That's the whole, that's her whole character straight. It's not going to go anywhere or get any more complex later down the line. Maybe in the show, but again, for now that's literally all Cindy is there to do. <laughs> This strip is interesting because like, there's several different drawings and angles, like to the point where it's almost a little surprising. It's very anti aaron but I, I appreciate the attempt to go for something a little more cinematic. I don't know what Riley's doing wearing the goggles though, I don't know where that, I don't know where that's coming from. <laughs> Welcome to the Afro Denial arc, a big part of this video but not the only part. Again, I really like how Aaron does these subtle changes with Jasmine. The strip is five panels, and one is just dedicated to Jasmine fiddling with her hair. You don't have to draw that detail, but it adds so much to characterize Jasmine's insecurities here. It really lays the groundwork for the next story arc. Okay, so Afro denial. Jasmine's gonna spend the next few comic strips overtly denying that she has an Afro. This is done for a few reasons, but one of the big ones is Aaron wants to explore Jasmine's relationship with her blackness more. If the first story arc was about how Jasmine is perceived, 
then this story is about how Jasmine feels about herself. Huey's punchline of making things up from his imaginary book is always funny in its own way, but as you'll see, it's a genuine concern for the character. When you have a black nationalist, you need the confused biracial girl to play off him. Okay, this is our first introduction to Sarah Dubois. Am I gonna talk about Sarah? I'm gonna have to talk about Sarah. How long is this recording going? Another reservatory take, but she's not gonna show up all the time, so I might as well take the time to kind of tackle a bit of her character here. Sarah, while it's subtle, thinks she has the depth to be able to discuss and speak on black experiences. It's something that Huey, and by extension Aaron, seems to always shut down. Really dive into this. Was Sarah ruined? This is a big conversation that I see a lot. I hate jumping ahead with this series, but Sarah's not going to appear that often, and I really want to dive into it here. For all the good things she did, she's certainly a more nuanced character in the comic strip. I'm going to be blunt. Sarah is not really a character. She's not. She's a vessel to comment on Jasmine and by extension, Tom's black identity. In the pilot script and eventually even the show, she's used to comment on Tom's authenticity as a black man and by extension, his masculinity. More on that in the next strip, but with all that said, I have one final question. In a strip, a show, a franchise, conceptually like the Boondocks, what purpose does a Sarah Dubois actually serve? When people talk about how Sarah has been ruined, I must ask, who has she been ruined for? This is a white woman in a black show. It is time to get over it. <laughs> for now. Make no mistake, this doesn't mean I'm in love with what they're trying to say about Tom either, but that's more of a down the line. Let's get back into it. Let's talk about Tom and what his actual deal is. It's very clear why Tom has his name. He's a play on Uncle Tom and before Ruckus, Thomas Dubois was Huey's Uncle Tom. Something I like about the Boondocks is how it flips the script and what the spectrum is for politics. Typically, in adult animated fare and even live action media, there's a presentation of conservative ideas and liberal ideas. And, and generally, if those ideas are to be discussed, addressed, or engaged with, it's going to fall somewhere in that spectrum. The Boondocks flips this, and the spectrum, instead of starting at liberal, starts at radical black communist and ends at liberal. At this point in the series, Tom is the most far-right character depicted, but he's a Democrat. And I think this inversion of the status quo is part of what makes the Boondocks unique as a property. It's part of what makes this series subversive to begin with. More on topic, Tom explains that Jasmine is insecure about her hair, and that both of them have tried to do everything they can to make her hair look like her mother's. A key line here is, we don't know what to do with it. This implies a lot. It implies Tom doesn't even know how to treat or manage black hair. And Tom's choice of trying to double down on trying to fix her hair speaks to a key problem. But there's also something I want to say about Huey here. Huey clearly cares. He cares about how Jasmine feels to her hair. He cares about how Jasmine feels to her blackness, even going as far to go to her parents about it. And in spite of his frustration boiling over at times, he still makes that effort. But if this is really how Jasmine feels, Huey could just say she has nice hair. But he never does this, even if, very explicitly, this is how he feels. I think it's interesting that the comic, the pilot, and even the show to some capacity will play into this idea that Huey does feel something towards Jasmine, that she's able to bring out his childish side. Besides, your little friend Jasmine would be at the bus stop. What about her? He like her, but he's scared. I'm not scared. Don't be scared. I think Huey as a character is made much more interesting here. He wants to help Jasmine, but the one very direct way he could help her in saying that she has nice hair, he doesn't do. And based on external media, I think it's because he's shy or very protective of his image, much like Riley. Something to think about. On a lighter note, this is a very nice Sunday. Really love it. It's interesting that Aaron was really getting into the habit of drawing the town of Woodcrest and how much it would be Riley just exploring the area. This is our first set of comic strips that got a lot of backlash involving Riley. In All the Rage, Aaron says, Violence has always been a part of comics, because violence has always been a part of childhood. Peanuts, Calvin and Hobbes, and all other classic comics have kids knocking the shit out of each other. Even still, I gave in to the syndicate's request to keep violence off panel. Still didn't help. I was a bit upset by the fallout of these strips, which were so ridiculously overblown. Some said it was the Corbyn effect. I still think it was a racist double standard. Racial, man. Racial. Reading the content of these strips, yeah, I don't really think it was a big deal. <laughs> Especially considering some of the stuff the comic strip would pull later, yeah, it, it wasn't really a big deal. 
I think the only interesting nugget here that you might notice down the line is that despite going out to newspapers and having creative control, the boondock was still edited and made to fit the newspapers. The syndicate or his editors would still push him to change things. Something to think about. 10 people control 90% of everything you see, read, and hear in this country. 10 people. I, I mean, you know, one of the great things about Universal Press is that they've never, they've never said, look, we're not putting this out. We, we can't send this out. There's no way we're going to do it. They have called me and said, okay, if we send this out, this will be the repercussions. You'll lose Philadelphia and New York and Chicago, and, but it's up to you. <laughs> then I rethink, you know, that joke really wasn't that funny. The jokes here are funny, though. This is the first time Riley beat Cindy, and it goes about as well as you think it did. You can tell that Aaron liked writing Riley where he could, because no matter where the strip went, Riley would still do something. Another Sunday about Jasmine being biracial. I don't love the artwork here, but the shot of Jasmine looking up at the clouds is really nice. Welcome to the Clan Watch arc. This is where it becomes much clearer that Aaron is playing into how paranoid Huey is. But once again, his fears are grounded in something very real. The neighborhood has recently been desegregated. Cindy explaining how our parents view the situation makes this very clear. There's some degree of hostility here. Even the concept of a Clan Watch is a real thing. The Southern Poverty Law Center literally had a Clan Watch designed around monitoring white supremacist activities within the neighborhood. The purpose being to inform and keep people safe. Oddly enough, Aaron said this one also got him into trouble. In doing a series where Huey decides to establish a neighborhood clan watch, I had him plan to stock an outrageous supply of weapons. My editor made me make Huey's weapon demands even more outrageous and less specific at the same time. Thus I changed the MP5 machine gun and the 50 caliber Desert Eagle to flamethrowers and light artillery. The Columbine High School shootings had taken place less than two months previous, on April 20th, 1999, and my syndicate was nervous about having guns in the comics. And we officially have our first ever unseen comic strip. That's right, there was a strip here that didn't make it. In this unseen strip, Huey is lamenting about how there's been a rise in hate crimes, and how they can't rely on the police for protection, and the punchline is Huey asking for a shotgun. It's also how we end up with Huey doing it in the first place. The New World Order. If you want to talk about something that shows you when this was made, <laughs> oh my god. This is a Boondock series and explaining New World Order is not part of the agenda, so I'm not going to do that. <laughs> the punchline of Huey being the one on the phone is a really goofy one. If you begin to notice, if you're starting to notice, Huey acts a lot more childishly, and I think I really like that as a way to balance out his character. I think Huey works best when presented with these childlike traits because again, it makes him feel like more of a character and less of a stand-in for the creator's perspective. This is a cool one because it was 1999 and this is the first time they ever allude to the idea of giving Riley cornrows. We actually learn how he got them later on in the strip and it's one of the best payoffs in the comic. There's quite a few of these so keep your eye open, there's one coming up. Aaron seems to be dedicating a few of these Sundays to Jasmine and it's nice. The selective salvation joke is a very nice quip. This one ties really well into what Aaron was originally saying about the comic strip, that it's a look at the world through the lens of the kids. It's really sweet the way Aaron sometimes ties these mundane, childlike ideas into real world politics. And when he is able to do that, that's when I think these characters are at their strongest. I won't bore you with every detail. These next series of strips are just Huey and Riley on the computer. Something I will give Aaron credit for is that usually he would just copy and paste the characters here. But, but he actually redraws Huey and Riley for each panel, and I think it's a really nice detail that I appreciate. Only some notes here, fugnews.com isn't real, but the Electronic Urban Report is. It's interesting that this might have been where the Free Huey World Report got its name, or at least the report part of it. This is one of the Boondocks' first self-aware jokes. It's very meta since it's referring to the comic strip launching in April of that year. This strip doesn't matter to me as much as it does that Grandad is depicted with a walking stick. In the show, and I don't know, I need, I need to stress this. In the show, Grandad is depicted so damn agile. You'd think he's been training his whole life. Like even outside the fight scenes, this guy would just be walking with such pace. He, he's old, but they never present it like he is. Like they animate him like he's just a regular, normal, young guy. They animate him like he's Tom. This is the first time I think they showcase that Grandad is actually an old man. 
it might be worth using this as a touch point to talk about why Huey and Riley don't have parents. Why don't you have the two boys being brought up by their grandfather? Uh, the boys are brought up by their grandfather because I felt if they were brought up by their parents, the parents would be a little too hands-on. Uh, and having, you know, the, the grandfather whose attitude is, you know, well, now that I've gotten you into a nice neighborhood, I basically, you know, you have nothing to worry about and I can just watch television all day. It, uh, it was meant to, to, to sort of allow the boys to sort of have to, uh, you know, encounter the neighborhood on their own. Uh, with with not as much sort of parental supervision uh, or or or, uh, or oversight than than they would have if their parents were actually there. This strip is interesting because at this point in the series, Grandad hasn't really complained about anything. He's been true to his word that he came here to relax and been relatively hands off with Huey and Riley. Typically, it's the kids complaining and Grandad wanting to be left alone. This is where the idea for Riley was here come from. It reinforces the idea that Riley did this for Grandad, and it's sweet in its own little way. This is another one of those threads that gets paid off in the show, so, yeah. So the Clan Watch story isn't over, but at this point in the story, there's been quite a few story arcs intersecting with each other. Also, Pat Butcherman was actually racist, so, yeah. <laughs> it's interesting that Huey makes a habit of, like, kind of pointing out that these people that may or may not have been revered by white people are racist or have a history of racism, and it's one of my favourite little running jokes in the comic strip. Huey suspecting Sarah of being in the clan is funny, but it's the first time we get confirmation that she's a lawyer for the NAACP. This is the first time we encounter the idea that what Huey is doing is positive. When framed this way, it is. Despite the paranoia, when Huey is earnest in his attempt to make the world a better place, it's something to sympathize with. Huey becomes less positive and less sympathetic in my eyes when the brunt of his character is criticizing black people. Not much to say here again, but I like the punchlines for these strips. Huey never interacts with Sarah in the show, so this is the first time we get a sense for what, what their relationship is. More on this around 2002. Silly little Sunday, like this one. The only point that I think is interesting to note is this idea that Grandad doesn't help in making these kids impressionable, because he very much encourages them to watch the TV he's paying for. Jasmine's back and she wants to play Gone with the Wind. Gone with the Wind was a romantic film that was heavily criticized for depicting slavery as a positive thing. I think it's cute that Huey ultimately sympathizes with Jasmine's feelings of being alone, and ultimately that Jasmine plays into Huey's sympathetic side to get him to do what he wants. There's an element of this show that we see only like once. It's really nice to see present here. And this is another one of my favorites. This feels like a really good punchline to end our comic strip section for the day. All right. <laughs>